Yeah, so like I said, uh, oh, all right, there we go. Get it, Steven. So like you said, my name's Chris. Uh, what we're going to talk to you guys today about is uh, fluid applied roofing and roof restoration. We're going to kind of go over some of the different options that are within that space of fluid applied roofing systems, kind of ranging from coatings up to recognized ASTM fluid applied roofs. We're going to talk about some of the cost applications of that, how that impacts your facilities. And we'll talk about, uh, you know, like what makes fluid applied roofing superior to traditional, more rolled good type of roofs. And so we'll start out with kind of going, what is a fluid applied roof? And so essentially what it's going to be for you uh, is going to be a monolithically fluid applied cured roof. And so if you think about traditional roof systems, you know, you think of asphaltic rolls, you know, kind of going back to the gravel built up felt days, you know, the kind of then moving into modified bitumens and single plies. And so all of those, the thing that all those have in common is they're going to be pre-cured rolls that you essentially go in the field and you adhere or weld together to make a continuous membrane. So the main difference between that and fluid applied is essentially you're taking an uncured product into the field and applying it with reinforcement such that it cures and forms a monolithic layer with no seams. The good thing about that is that most of the moisture intrusion issues we see in roofs are going to be at the seams and transitional areas. So I've been in building science for a long time. And so one of the stats that we've kind of come to learn through the, the continual study of buildings is that about 90% of your moisture intrusion issues will occur at only 1% of your building envelope. And so it's the details. That 1% is gonna typically be some type of, you know, a seam, a transitional area, going from one cladding type to another on your vertical facades, going from a roof to wall condition, horizontal to vertical, at your expansion joints, things like that, that's going to be your 1%. And so what's great about the technology of a fluid applied roof, since it's cured in field instead of pre-cured in a roll, it essentially bonds to everything. And so you essentially build a bathtub up on the roof. You know, you're going to have a monolithic surface. You're going to use primers and application adhesives to be able to go up your vertical equipment curbs, penetrations, uh, plumbing stacks, things like that. All the things that you're going to typically get your your leaks from and your moisture intrusion from. Roof drains are very, very problematic when it comes to low slope roofing. The reason for that is that it typically relies on compression. And so, you know, you'll have a water block that you put down onto your substrate and then you put the clamping ring down. You guys have all seen these and then you have the, the strainer dome on top. Well, that clamping ring, you have to screw that thing down with bolts. And as over time, as water, and sand and debris and things like that wash into that roof drain, the membrane thins. And if you don't go and continually tighten down that clamping ring, you're going to have a void between the surface of your membrane and the bottom of that clamping ring, and you get moisture intrusion to that condition. It's very, it's one of the usual suspects. We see it all the time in moisture intrusion. One of the applications of fluid applied is that you just put, run it all the way down to the leader of the, the plumbing vent or the, uh, the, the drain bowl and it makes a monolithic surface, so you don't have to worry about that compression ring anymore. So that's, that's what basically fluid applied roofing is. Forms a monolithic membrane. You're typically very nuts and bolts application. You're gonna see a primer, a base coat, a reinforcing mesh, and a top coat. It's gonna be a very standard, kind of average run of the mill fluid applied system. It can be applied with a trowel or a squeegee. So typically what you'll see is the guys will kind of mix the buckets up. You have one part and two parts. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. Typically you're gonna see the guys mix the two parts and they're gonna kind of have the buckets, the pails staged in squares, you know, 100, 100 square feet or a roofing square. They know exactly what coverage rate they need. They kind of map that out. They'll mix it up, pour it out. You'll see a guy with a squeegee and then you'll see a guy with a nap roller that he's gonna back roll that membrane back out to thickness for the base coat, embed the mesh, wait for that to cure, depending on what that product is. It could be a day, two days, depending on the cure time, come back and top coat that same area and you can't kind of keep moving on. It could also be brushed with a chip brush at those detailing penetration locations. So, you, you know, hands and knees, very fine detail work to make sure that it's fully monolithic. And then you can also spray it. Don't recommend that in Florida with the high winds, you're gonna end up painting cars. So stay away from that uh, if, you, if you have that in mind. So we're going to jump over to Alan. He's going to talk a little bit about why fluid applied roofing. Yeah, so I'm not a, an engineer in roofing penetrations or envelopes. I'm, uh, I'm the end user. Uh, I've been able to use this at now three institutions. Uh, we started using it at the University of Florida uh, for a lot of reasons. And one of them was sustainability goals. Uh, so we have a lot of roofs. 
nurse that we needed to, we thought, replace. And within that, uh, obviously, you have a lot of tear off. You have a lot of insulation, a lot of concrete. Whatever's under that roof, we were taking off and sending it to the landfill. They have a very high sustainability waste reduction rate. And being able to use this application keeps us from basically throwing away the roof. Uh, so the, the existing roof stays in place and uh, you, you're overlaying what is there. So sustainability wise, it was a big, a big influence for us. The other, time, uh, the other piece of it is tying. Uh, so you can imagine the process that Chris went through, how long that takes. You know, you're up there, the roof is already there. Uh, you're cleaning, you're priming, you're putting down the application. Whereas on the other side, you're tearing the roof off, you're taking stuff down to dumpsters, you have to let it dry out. Uh, so this, where it could take a couple of weeks, the other side could take a couple of months, you know, if you're doing a roof tear off. Uh, the other thing that we found as a benefit, and this is not specifically to the roof, is uh, Trimco and, and others, but we chose Trimco, are on uh, cooperative purchasing agreements. And so on the front end, when we're doing procurement, we're saving three or four months of going through that procurement process. We're not having to go out for bids. All of this is in place. The costing is there. We'll talk about cost in a minute, but it's all laid out for you. All you have to do is have them come out. The good thing is they're going to do an evaluation of the roof. They're going to infrared scan the roof and tell you, can this be done? Is it possible? And uh, Chris will tell you a lot of it's based on moisture. How much moisture content is there? Yeah. If there's too much moisture, yeah, it's probably not going to work for you. They're going to have to tear it off. If the moisture is low, or if it's in certain areas, they can tear off areas and then you know go back with those. But um, you know that's that's the same as that you'll know in advance whether or not the roof is a good candidate uh, by the infrared scan. And then once they have the infrared scan, they'll actually go back and walk the roof and say, okay, this area looks hot. Let's go look at it. Uh, is, was there just water laying on the roof at the time, or is there really water in the insulation. Uh, some of the other things we've seen over the last five or six years uh, has been materials availability. So I don't know if you did any roof replacements in the last five or six years, but for a while you couldn't get insulation. Uh, it was coming over literally on the slow bump from China and COVID happened and that was one of the materials for a while you couldn't get. So this was another option that we could continue to replace roofs without having those materials available. Talked about the, the, the process, you know, going through uh, the, the availability to apply over multiple traditional roof uh, applications is important. It's not just for, you know, it's not just uh, bed or bed or shingles or whatever. Uh, it, it can be put over multiple uh, current roofing applications. Uh, this is uh, an application that we did in Eastern Florida about a year and a half ago. This is a student center in Cocoa. We actually used three different applications in this building. After the infrared scan, and I don't know if you can see it, uh, there's a lower roof here that had never been replaced. That roof was too wet to apply. So we had to tear that one completely off and start over. But the primary roof, which is what you see on the top, uh, was a good candidate. Uh, the other thing that you get out of this is some good uh, characteristics of uh, reducing your heat. It's a very, very, very white uh, surface. And it's very reflective. Uh, and so the other application that we used here, I don't know if we're going to talk about this, but this front area used to be silver uh, standing seam roof. Uh, it started to show signs of rust. And it was only surface rust, so we wanted to get out in front of that. So we went ahead and did the entire roof while we were doing the, the flat roof and made a decision that let's go with school colors while we're doing it. So the, the availability to change the color of the roof was another benefit of using uh, the product with the elbow. So and you apply that to the standing seat? Right over the standing seat roof. Yeah, okay. it was a bright silver, or it used to be a bright silver. It was a faded silver uh, with just rust spots, you know, at the seam too. Is that, that portion, does that include the reinforcement or is that just a single application? That one does not have reinforcement. Yeah, the metal does not. 
Yeah, so it's at, it's kind of a three three course application on the metal. So on metal, it's better because of the high properties of elongation and expansion of metal. Rather than using a mesh, it's better to use a heavy aliphatic urethane. And so the seams and any exposed fasteners, if you have an exposed fastener panel, are going to be reinforced with mastic. And so you put that on first, and that's what actually gets your roof watertight. Because, you know, that's what, on metal, you're going to get leaks at seams and fastener locations. And so if the fasteners are backing out due to thermal movement, those are replaced beforehand and then dolloped with the, the heavy mastic. And so that's your waterproofing application. And then to achieve the high sheen floor polymer type finish like a Kynar, it's a, it's a two coat application with, uh, you know, like a urethane. And then the top is an acrylic hybrid. Yeah. And we did this, we did an application for a full building actually uh, at England Air Force Base uh, about five years ago. The building, which was an engineering building for the University of Florida in England, uh, the roof had leaked from the onset of the building being built. Uh, the roofing contractor actually walked away from the job. We didn't have a warranty. And so we fought it for like 15 years. Uh, it was not standing, so we had, it had the, the fasteners all over it, so we had leaks in the fasteners. We had leaks throughout the building. It was kind of ugly uh, inside the building because we'd always find a way. And we did this application for the entire roof, sealed up everything. It's right on the coast, literally on the coast. Salt water, you know, wind every day, and we haven't had any problems. No leaks since we put that on. So it's been a good, a good experience with that. And then Eric was here. We're going to try that uh, at Daytona State. We've got a couple of roofs, uh, but we'll talk about costs later, and I'll share some of that. Yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about the different types. So I want to kind of lay out the full range. So a lot of you guys maybe have had some experience. It, it's almost like these come in waves. Like there was a, a big wave in the 80s of like maybe like acrylics and silicones. And then it kind of got a bad name because people were asking it to do things it couldn't do. It went away for a while and then it came back. And again, that cycle kind of followed. And so that's what I want to leave with you guys with when it comes to the full suite of fluid applied is that there are chemistries and costs that are specific to each of these. And as long as we understand what they're made for and what they're supposed to be used in what ways, then we're going to have success. But if we try to ask a coating to do a fluid applied job, we're going to, it's not going to go well, right? And then vice versa. If you're looking for the budget of a coating and you're asking for a fluid applied, then you're going to have budget overruns. And so as we kind of roll through these, we'll talk about the different applications. And this is kind of set up to go from kind of the, the kind of like workhorses that are cheap, that are really more surfacings up through coatings and then into fluid applied. And so everybody's probably seen this at some point, uh, you know, you get a, a leak on a penetration and they come and spread some aluminized asphalt around it, you know, three course it and things like that. Very kind of low rent repair, but can be very effective to kind of punt the problem down the road until you can allocate budget and things like that. Then you move into kind of epoxies and acrylics. And so acrylics in like a hybrid setting, like we were talking about on the standing seam metal and the metal roof applications, they can, they can really give you some longevity. But if you're going to just kind of paint on an acrylic, you're not going to get a lot of life out of that. It's really going to be more of like a surfacing and protecting the existing roof more than, you know, kind of providing a new roof. And so you have those there. Uh, the floor polymers are going to be the colorized products. So that's where you'll see, you know, like your deep blues, your oranges, greens, things like that. Those are the products that you see there. And if you're just looking for color, you know, one coat application to just achieve that color is possible. If you're looking for waterproofing and color, that's where you're going for the multi-step application like Alan was talking about. And so then we now we're kind of starting to get more into uh, the higher level fluid applied products, so like your rubberized asphalts. You see this a lot on terraces and plazas and things like that under pavers. So like a hot rubberized asphalt is kind of what we're talking about here. And so those are kind of in this fluid applied technology. And if you have, you know, balconies that you want to have foot traffic and people walking on and things like that, these are a great application for that. And then also the urethanes are a great product to use in that application. And then silicones, uh, these are mostly going to be for reflective surfacing. They're not going to get a lot of long life in, in Florida where we have so much rain. The product is very soft. As you know, we use these a lot in vertical control joints and expansion joints in buildings. So it's very soft. It has very high elongation, which is great. 
the application of it to cover an entire roof, it's not going to get the wear and tear that you're looking for because of the softness of it. A lot of the facilities that you guys manage have a lot of foot traffic. You have a lot of mechanical equipment and things like that. And it's going to get really checked and scarred just from that foot traffic. If you have, you know, like a, like a strip mall or something like that, that you just have a monoslope roof and you're not going to have a lot of foot traffic, slop that silicone on and it's going to keep you watertight for a few years. That's really the application that those are geared towards. And then if you have any existing spray polyurethane foam roofs, silicone is good for that. That's also a product that's kind of come in waves and gone away and come back every 10 years or so. People are trying to start hawking that again. Then we move into methyl methacrylate. So these are your very hardened, uh, high rigidity concrete restoration fluid applied coatings. You'll see this used a lot as traffic coatings on parking decks uh, for municipalities where they really need to get a lot of long life. You can get 10 to 20 year warranties on these PMMA products. And then you also have a urethane hybridized version of that, a PUMA. And so these can be used on roofs. They're going to be, they're going to be very expensive. They're going to kind of rival the cost of a full roof replacement rather than being a, a more effective cost than a, than a full roof replacement. But sometimes they can get up to 30 year warranties on roofs and kind of like 20 year warranties for vehicular traffic. Does that need a mask? Like yeah, so these are on roofs that are gonna be reinforced with mesh with an overlap at the seam. And typically on concrete restoration, you're gonna have a butt joint at the, at the mesh. And so that kind of gives it that tensile strength as the, so like if you can imagine in a parking deck, you're gonna have dy dynamic movement joints. And so you're gonna have a lot of tension at those areas. And so having that mesh reinforcement is good there. And then on roofs, you're going to have the expansion of the asphalt and the differential movement of edge metal and penetrations and things like that. And so that mesh gives it the tensile strength that it's looking for. It's kind of like the concept of rebar and concrete. So the coating itself is going to be really good in compression. And then the mesh gives you the tensile that you need to be able to carry the differential loads. So that this is the, the PUMA, the polyurethane hybridized coatings, and then bituminous polyurethanes. These are going to be some, again, of those uh, hot asphaltic type uh, pedestrian traffic coatings for plaza decks and terraces. There are two types of urethanes, uh, and both of them need to be used in the correct application sequence. So aromatic and aliphatic. Aromatic has very, very high elongation and is really great for base coats. And then aliphatic, it introduces UV stability. And so those are for top coats. And so a lot of times when you get into two layer traffic coatings, having a aromatic base coat with an aliphatic top coat is a really good system because you get some of those elongation properties with UV stability. Uh, typically, these used to be used a lot in roofing applications as well and still are in some parts of the country where you get a lot bigger temperature swings because you're gonna have a lot different thermal expansion. In Florida, it's actually best to use a two coat aliphatic because both coats are UV stable. And so what that allows you to do is when your top coat weathers and you get down to your base coat, typically you can prime and re-top coat because you didn't get any damage from UV instability and you can extend the life of, of that existing restoration. All right, so Alan's gonna talk a little bit more about the advantages as we move forward here. Coatings that we are that we've typically applied in the past, we're getting we're going with a higher end roof coating, and we're getting a 20-year warranty on that roof. Uh, and so, at the end of that 20 years, as Chris said, as that top layer is worn off, you can come back and recoat that roof and extend that warranty another 20 years. And so, that's a huge advantage. You're not you already know that the roof is sealed. Uh, they'll reassess the roof to make sure you don't have any leaks, and by then you'll know you know you have one in the building. Uh, but getting a, a 40 year warranty on a roof without tearing off and starting over is a huge advantage. <clears throat> the other uh, advantage is, is cost. Is that me? Uh, the seamless construction, let's start with that. So, we talked, uh, Chris talked about that at the beginning. You don't have the seams that you typically do, you don't have seams around the flashings. Um, you're basically, as he put it, building a bathtub. You know, so that bathtub has to not leak. Uh, so your, your drainage has to be in place and everything has to be good there. But you don't have those same, same penetrations that you do with a typical roof. Uh, it's adaptable. We already went through some of that. It's waterproof, obviously. You don't have hot uh, work permits because you don't have flames and torch. You don't have the, uh, the ability to catch the roof on fire or have uh, you know, incidents of that nature. Uh, getting 
materials to the roof is, is very beneficial. They're not pulling down lightweight concrete and insulation. You're basically hauling up buckets of material at that point. So uh, we already talked about sustainability. Uh, you have buckets left over. That's what you have for uh, your waste. And they're metal buckets. So if you can clean them, you can recycle them. Uh, so in other words, uh, we talked about restorability, uh, multicolored. So with the example that we used earlier with the, the white silver roof that we turn into blue is another option. Uh, you're not looking there for reflectivity and all that. You're really looking for the aesthetics of the roof. It's the roof that you see when you drive into campus. It's the first building you see, and we wanted the blue, the, the campus blue to show. So that's why we went with that. Um, Safety and welfare, you don't have uh, the ongoing uh, work conditions around the building where you're taking down all these materials and things. Uh, and then again, you're creating a safe environment for your workers to be uh, to work on the roof. Uh, ease of installation. Yeah, so we just talked about the details. About how it, like you're sealing up the penetrations in the joints. Uh, again, you're creating that bathtub, that, that seamless penetration around the roof. Uh, it works on many applications. I've never used it for this, but obviously, uh, putting a roof on a slope like this would be very costly and very uh, difficult to do and time consuming. So, being able to brush on a raw, a, a, a slope roof like this is very beneficial in this radius. Is that Titusville? Mm -hmm. So we have a building in Titusville. Uh, again, uh, it's it shown out with infrared to have a low uh, moisture content. It's right, again, right on the, uh, the Indian River. Uh, you can actually stand on this roof and see, you can see the little towers in the back here are rocket launch towers. Mm -hmm. So we're literally on the coast. Um, so again, a very good application. It took us no time to uh, seal this roof, no, no um, issues with the classes, we've got to shut down classes, there's no noise, you know, they're not, they're not uh, demoing the roof and causing noise issues. So we did this during the, during the actual classroom sessions and it had no effect on uh, what was going on in the classes. Uh, thank you. get to that in a second. Uh, sustainability, we talked about the uh, SRI, SRI energy savings, uh, reflectivity of the roof. I think this one on the bottom, this looks like a roof I think that we may have done at UFL. So it's very similar. Yeah. But you maintain the roof substrate, as long as it's in good condition, you can see where we went from uh, 90, almost 92 degrees, down to 57 degrees roof temperature. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what that does to your, your interior uh, need for HVAC. Uh, we talked about multicolor. This is some of the colors that are available, and, and more than this. Uh, but and again, it's a good advantage to be able to change colors if you want to. And, and if you're not looking for that, so disadvantages. Is that me or you? Yeah, I'll, t I'll talk to it real quick. <laughs> you just stay right there because okay. we're going to roll into calls. So, so you know, I mean, we're we're definitely talking about how great it is. Obviously, uh, you know, it's a it's a huge advancement in technology from a roofing standpoint, and there are a lot of great advantages to it. But at the end of the day, there is no magic bullet. It would be disingenuous to say this is the greatest thing ever. There's no problems with it. There's no issues with it. And so, just to kind of level set, there are a couple things that you have to be very very cognizant of during one of these roof restoration projects. The temperature is important, just like any fluid applied, you know, a sealant product. Anything like that that's going to be cured in the field, you have to apply it at the appropriate temperature. And so that's going to be an application. Uh, you know, the further south we go, we really don't run into conditions like that. But as we kind of move out into the panhandle, we get several freezing days. And we were actually going through the, the course of a project with uh, not one of the restoration project products, but one of our cold adhesive products at a, at a naval base. And we were running into issues with curing of the base flashings because the temperature was kind of down towards the lower end. It was technically within the range of where they could apply it. They were putting it on too quickly before it had fully tacked up and cured, and they were having slippage of the base flashings. And so 
being aware of that and cognizant of that when you have a project that comes around is going to be important for you. And then thickness control as well. Um, you know, you're not going to, if you, if you have a little bit, not quite enough material, it's not going to cause like moisture intrusion or issues or anything like that. What it's really going to impact is the longevity of the system. And so you just want to make sure you have the appropriate mill thickness so that you can extend the life that full 20 years or 40 years during the recode application. Uh, and that's very simple, you know, just a wet mill gauge by you know, what we typically do is just ask the installer at the at the first application and then kind of before lunch and then after lunch just to make sure that throughout the day they're consistently applying the material at the recommended mill thickness. Just stick it in there, take a photo of it, put it in their daily report is a really good quality control application. But that is something to be aware of as well. And so, you know, again, no magic bullets, but a lot more pros than cons, so to speak. Uh, it, it's built in the field, so you can get different application rates depending on the warranty you want. So if you want 10 years, one thing, 15, 20. So, uh, you know, if you go the full 20, 25 year system, including mesh and reinforcement and things like that, you're up over 100 mils. So what Chris talked about, that's a benefit for like you guys. You don't have resources to be on that roof 24-7 or while the entire crew is there. And so you'll get a report, as you presented every day, with a picture throughout the day where they're wet uh, gauging that roof. And then you can save those, those photos for, uh, for future use. You can reference re re those and say, yes, uh, we have an issue at, you know, at, the, at the gauge of, uh, that we need to be in. So uh, it saves some time from your guy. You can go back and inspect as you need to versus having somebody on site do daily inspections or health inspections. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead. I'm sure everybody's wondering how much it costs. Costs. Okay, so economically, uh, again, we talked about the, the pre, pre procurement of co-ops, but realistically, you're going to save between 30 and 40 to 50 percent over a full worth risk commission. Uh, less materials to the landfill, we talked about that already. Uh, you're reusing existing insulation, which is another sustainability factor. Uh, minimal disturbance of ongoing activities, and so if you're in an educational institution or even a business, you're not affecting that business down below, and work can be done during normal operating hours. Uh, contractor friendly, obviously we talked about some of that already. The high risk activity, again, is a sustainability and a savings from the interior HVAC. Uh, we talked about long-term warranty, so you can, you can adjust. And so if you don't have the funding to get to a 20-year, you can get down to the thickness of a 10-year warranty if that's what you choose to do. Or you can do the mid-15 you know, mid or up to the 20. We're, we're choosing to do the 20. We want to get a 20-year warranty. And then we have the availability to come back and recall in 20 years and get another 20-year warranty. Uh, existing insulation is not exposed. The R value does not exceed the use of the IECC standard. So again, you're, you're increasing the uh, your availability or your ability to even cool that, that uh, roof. So just as an example, uh, Eric's got a building uh, that he brought forth a couple months ago, uh, science building at Daytona State, and we had budgeted, I think, like 800000 is what we expected it to cost. Uh, they did. Trimco came in and did the evaluation of the roof. The roof was a good candidate. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it came in at like $500,000 uh, for recovery. So we took the extra, or we're going to take the extra 300,000 and do envelope work, windows, uh, penetrations of the building. And so we're actually going to get the entire building sealed by saving the money that we would have used to, uh, to tear the roof off. So we're making that money go even further uh, and end up pulling up with 100% sealed building at that point. So one of the things that we like to talk about is there's often a disconnect between the first cost of a, a roofing project or an envelope project and the way that facility managers budget. So typically it's dollars per year. You know, you have this many dollars per year in the budget. And so what we like to try to do is kind of reorient that conversation towards cost per square foot per year versus cost per square foot. And so one of the things that you can do with a fluid applied application is break it down in that way. And then particularly once you get back into the recoat after the initial warranty, you're really very drastically driving the cost per square foot per year down because you're not having to spend all that money to remove it and all the labor to remove it and things like that. And so that's, that's a very important thing to consider is that cost per square foot per year. 
and doing a 20-year restoration and then a retop coat to get a second 20-year, you're kind of starting to get down in the neighborhood of, of about a quarter per square foot per year. And the lowest you're really ever going to be able to get with kind of the put on, put on a roof, wait 20 years, tear it off, put a new roof back on, is about a dollar per square foot per year when you kind of project that out and you start talking about life cycle cost analysis. And so, you know, 25 cent per square foot per year versus a dollar per square foot per year, that's a drastic difference when you consider the amount of real estate that you guys all manage. And so that's, that's when you kind of start to get into long-term budgeting and five-year budget projections and things like that. That's kind of the language that we like to try to reorient this around instead of just the how much is it first cost per square foot. So that's something that we, we've seen a lot of, that trend towards that. Over the last few years, you know, we live in a very different world than we did, you know, in 2019. And so we kind of talk, you know, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. I actually I was getting some emails when I was setting up the booth earlier uh, from a, a school a school district manager, and he was like, "Hey, we need to we need to do a post-pandemic presentation to talk about how things have changed from an economic standpoint for roof restoration." And so what we've seen, that trend, uh, you know, kind of give you guys a highlight, but don't skip FEFPA where we're going to do that presentation, <laughs> is uh, we basically seen the cost of the material were on the rise and the cost of labor were on the rise. And then when the pandemic hit, those things shot up big time. Uh, what we saw from a raw goods standpoint is that a lot of the restoration materials did not go up nearly as much as the cost of traditional products went up. And then we also saw labor costs just go through the roof. And so one of the things that you can do with restoration is drastically cut down on the amount of time that the roofer is on the roof. And so you save tremendously on overall cost due to that decrease in labor. And so this was cost effective pre-pandemic. Post-pandemic, you're talking about half, like half the price of a full roof restoration. And so that's, that's kind of where we are in, in this world where we are now. Um, and so we're seeing that kind of over and over again, particularly as you get into more complicated procurement models of, you know, introducing construction management and architecture fees and things like that, really having that uh, as, a, as a restoration option, reducing the cost of labor. You can see some significant savings in, in your procurement channels and run into situations where, you know, you're saving enough to do your envelope work as well. That's a good point. So some of the soft costs that you do save with this are the architecture engineering fees uh, that you encounter with roof tear off, and those were running 20 to 25% of the overall cost of projects you know, where they used to be about 10%. So automatically, just without on the soft, soft, soft cost side, you're not incurring those soft costs in the front by not having a roof tear off and just doing the restoration. Yeah, a lot of the design time that would that would go into it, you know, the, the details are similar. You're not having to re reintroduce a lot of new details that you would when you expose the deck and introduce new details and things like that. So some of those some of those fees are able to be carried and smoothed out a little bit. So as far as fluid applied goes, let's talk about just the different applications that you can get into. Uh, this can be used in new construction as well. Um, typically, we're going to see this in like plaza and terrace type applications, uh, inverted roofs and, and vegetated roofs. You're not going to see this a lot in traditional construction because, again, the offsetting cost is going to be that you don't have to tear the roof off. And so in new construction, you're still going to have to put in insulation, cover board, base ply, and then do your fluid applied. So you don't have the same trade-off and cost advantage as you do in restoration, but it can be done. Uh, we were working on a project with a, a large architecture firm out of Tallahassee. They're doing an emergency operations center. And so they said, hey, we want this roof to be bulletproof. And so they're actually doing, uh, not, not literally bulletproof, but it might be because they're building it up so thick. But they, they basically, it's a, it's a mission critical facility, right? And so they like, we don't, this is where people are going to go during a, a storm. And so we want to have no moisture intrusion concerns. And so they're actually doing a, a traditional modified bitumen roof with a fluid applied system on top of it uh, to get a 30 year warranty and meet the, um, the enhanced standards that they're going to have to have to be that mission critical facility status. And then in repair, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about full system application, but this is phenomenal on leaks as well, uh, particularly if you do kind of, if you replace the old school three course with asphalt mesh and asphalt with polyurethane mesh and polyurethane, that's a really great repair technique, particularly at penetrations like you see in the photos there. Uh, and then restoration, we've, we've really hit that. Uh, and so I'm not going to go too much deeper into that, but, you know, modified bitumen, single plies, gravel built up roofs, metal, 
really all of those systems are, are potentials for candidacy as long as we, you know, complete the thermal diagnostic and determine that there's not too much wet insulation. And so in summary, uh, you know, fluid applied systems are going to be very budget sensitive. Again, that kind of that full range of products that are available all the way from kind of the, the workhorse coatings up to the truly recognized reinforced two coat polyurethane restoration systems. There's going to be a product for each budget and there's going to be a product for each need based on what you have. And so just consulting with someone that you trust in the industry to say, hey, this is this is the roof we have. This is the condition it's in. This is the budget that we have or say like, hey, what budget should we project? Um, you know, because you don't want to do a 20 year warranty on every roof, right? Sometimes you're going to run into a situation where, hey, we're, we're going to tear this building down in five years and we're going to build something new. So what can we do to limp this thing along until we get to that, that new building replacement? And so just having those conversations and having some transparency with someone you trust can be very, very beneficial. Um, design flexibility, again, like we were saying, uh, one of the things you run into now, because there's been a, a pretty drastic increase in uh, requirements for thermal insulation and things like that with new energy efficiency codes. And so sometimes you're going to run into an older roof that's maybe already been replaced once. You're going to have really low flashing heights and door thresholds and equipment curbs and things like that. And to replace that roof and bring the insulation thickness all the way up, you're going to run into a lot of adding new blocking and raising equipment curbs and that kind of thing. It can really make that roof expensive. Uh, and with the basically the variance to allow to do a, a white reflective restoration versus a tear off without having to increase the insulation can be a very effective solution just from a super practical standpoint of like, we don't want to spend the money to raise all these equipment curbs. Let's do a restoration. And so please take this away as well. Although the cost is very effective and it gets done much quicker and there are a lot of headaches you can avoid with restoration versus replacement, it is a much better product when you fully reinforce a polyurethane than with a rolled good. Again, you don't have the seams, you don't have to worry about the penetrations, everything's monolithic. And so it's one of those very rare circumstances in life where you kind of hit that intersection of better cost and better outcome. And so it's a great opportunity to really seize that and say, hey, we're gonna pay less, but it's not less than, if that makes sense. So please take that away. Before you leave, this, this, this is the highest number you can get. Uh, and to Chris's point, you can see where the old seams are. So these are, before you can see the overlap of the seams. Uh, and now these are completely sealed out. But the other thing that you see on the truth are the mechanicals. And these, as you can see, these aren't new mechanicals. We didn't have the money to do the mechanicals. And so at some point, before this 20 year roof is up, probably soon for some of these uh, rusted equipment, this equipment's gonna have to be torn off this roof. And so being able, not, <laughs> to go in and tear this equipment off and then reseal and repair around that equipment is much, much, much easier and simpler with this process than you were to have to patch in uh, roll material and that sort of thing. So you really get a good seal around the equipment if you have to go back in the future and do equipment replacement. So it's just another from the something these guys don't deal with, but you as facility managers will have to deal with. All right, how do I fix the roof after I put in new exhaust vents or new lab bit vents or things of that nature? So, yeah, that's a good point. Just from a high level, the repair, like he's talking about cutting in new equipment, or you know, if something gets damaged, you know, a guy up on the roof pushing a cart and something something happens to it, the repair is actually very easy. It's a primer to reactivate the existing top coat and base coat. New application, it all chemically bonds to itself. You can almost hardly even tell that a repair was done the way that it it chemically cures back to itself. And then the, the last thing I'll leave you guys with before we go into questions is there are also options for bio-based material out there in the industry now as well. And so that's become a major, major push in the federal sector. There's a huge requirement and it's kind of moving into the category of mandatory purchasing for a lot of the Department of Defense, GSA and VA. Um, and then I've also started to see some information introduced into state requirements here in Florida as well uh, through the Department of Management Services. Maybe it hasn't gotten to the universities and schools yet, but for like DMS controlled facilities, there are basically preferences that are outlined for renewable, sustainable bio-based material. And so there are those options as well, both for restoration and uh, replacement adhesives.